Welcome to the Museum of Richmond. My name is Hilda Clark and I'm the Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Museum. And I'm joined today by Professor Michael Burton from the Armagh Observatory and Planetarium. And we're going to have a discussion about our exhibition on the King's Observatory, um, called for many years the Q Observatory as well. And Professor Burton has joined me in order to discuss some aspects that tie the two observatories together. Um, he's going to explain that link. And also we're going to talk about the other aspects about the history of the observatory as well. George III had the observatory built in 1769 near to his summer residence at Richmond Lodge. He commissioned the famous architect Sir William Chambers, who had actually built the pagoda in what we now know as Kew Gardens, for him, and had built many famous buildings in England and in Ireland as well. And the observatory was commissioned in order for George III and his astronomer Stephen de Membre to watch the transit of Venus in 1769. Now, how the link between the King's Observatory and the Omar Observatory comes about is because many of the aspects um, of the materials of the King's Observatory actually ended up at the Armagh Observatory. And Professor Burton is going to explain that to us and talk about some of the objects that are there, particularly the Short's reflecting telescope that George III actually observed the transit of Venus on. Now, the opportunity that we have for Professor Burton to join us is obviously through our Zoom link, and we're going to try and adapt what we would have seen in the actual exhibition um, to that link and the conversation that we're going to have today. And particularly, I'd like to thank Professor Burton because, in fact, he was going to arrange for the telescope to come and be in the exhibition at Richmond, but unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions, neither he, neither the telescope could come, nor he to do the actual opening of the exhibition. So I'm delighted that he agreed to do this conversation. Let me start by also saying about Professor Burton that he himself is a distinguished astronomer. He's the director of the Armagh Observatory and Planetarium. He's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and also the International Astronomical Union as well. I'm sure there are other references he'll make to his career. And he's been astronomy gazing in many corners of the world um, and an eminent man in his own field. I'm going to start by asking Professor about the actual King's Observatory built in 1769, as we said, to um, observe the transit of Venus. Um, and it was only in 1790, in fact, very soon after, that the actual Amar Observatory was opened. In something I was reading, it was said that the Amar Observatory and its construction was very much affected and influenced by Sir William Changer's construction of the King's Observatory at Kew as well. So tell me, why was there this interest in astronomy in 18th century Britain? Ah, hello, Hilda. Yes, um, indeed. Uh, it's really, it, it's the, later, the, the age of the Enlightenment, I would call it. At this stage, it was, uh, it was after the period of Copernicus and Newton and Galileo and Kepler. And we'd started to realise about our place uh, in the cosmos, the fact that we were a planet going around a star. And there was this wonder, this inquiry out there. And I think King George got caught uh, in, this, in this new age, this Enlightenment. And, and was inspired and just wanted to be part of it. So he he basically had the observatory built for himself. And and, uh, and as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> yes, um, it's, I suppose, like many people like myself who, who are not scientists, certainly not astronomers or have any deep knowledge of it, can you explain what's the importance of observing the transit of Venus, and in particular about that event in 1769? Yes, indeed. The transit of Venus was really perhaps the first truly great international scientific experiment involved um, people from many countries all over the world because they had to come together for this experiment to work. So what the transit of Venus is about, it provides a way of measuring a fundamental size scale in astronomy. It's the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And basically, as the planet Venus, very occasionally, about every once a century, actually twice a century, it turns out to be, Venus goes between the Earth and the Sun, and yeah. so you can see Venus move across the face of the Sun. And if you can have people in different parts of the Earth observing this event and timing when it takes place, you can, through basically geometry, the kind of geometry you learn at school, work out the distance to the Sun. So you have to have people observing the, the same event yeah. widely spaced across the planet, and, and that's the way the science works. Oh, 
I see. Um, the actual event in 1769 is pretty unique, isn't it? Um, the link with James the Cook, James Cook being down in Australia, and your own Australian background, you're from New South Wales as well? Yes. Indeed. So, in fact, I mean, well, so, so King George, of course, was one of the, is, I guess, one of the stations that uh, was 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 the one at the uh, queue. But indeed, uh, the most, perhaps the most famous measurements were actually made by uh, by James Cook, Captain Cook, and uh, he went to the other side of the world, Tahiti, and he made the measurements there. And in fact, he had exactly the same clock that uh, the king had. Uh, yeah. The uh, Captain Cook had to carry it across the world. And of course, most famously, that after after he'd made the measurements, he opened a seal and basically told him to go and explore uh, the unknown lands and that's when he came and, and essentially mapped and charted the, uh, the east coast of Australia uh, and, uh, and of course uh, a decade or so later that's when the first fleet went out in the convicts and essentially the founding of modern Australia yeah. started. So it all actually goes back to the transit of Venus in fact, a very important event in the foundation of the country. Yeah, yeah. well we know that George III um, used the Short's reflecting telescope to observe the transit of Venus, and that's the link because you've actually got to the original there uh, in Armagh. Um, so what is the significance of that particular telescope that George III used? Okay, well, I'm going to now actually show you the telescope. I'm going to change my background with the magic of Zoom. I get this right, you can change your backgrounds. <laughs> and so behind me now, I actually have... Uh, the, uh, the, the Short Telescope, uh, Short was the name, it was James Short from Edinburgh, the great telescope manufacturer of this day. It wasn't the fact the telescope was short in size, oh. though by modern standards, yeah. it is actually quite short. But there it is uh, in front of in fact, one of the telescopes in Armagh called the Grubb Telescope, which is actually used for some very famous astronomy about a, a couple of centuries later. Mm -hmm. And also uh, on my uh, other side is the clock, the Shelton clock or regulator as it was called, and the key point is you have to have very accurate timing. In fact, the, it turned out that the timekeeping of the day was not accurate enough for the measurements that were required. In fact, it took another century or so before they were actually up to the technology. But they didn't know that at the time. Yeah. Uh, so the telescope that King George had, it was a special telescope. He had it, this actual telescope has three different foci and you can change between them. You don't normally build a telescope like that, but I guess the king, you have to build a special telescope. So James Short built his best ever telescope, and there it is behind me. And it still actually does work. I mean, I, it's, you can look through it, and, uh, and, uh, and I mean, it's a, bit, it's a bit blurry, but nevertheless, uh, uh, three, three centuries later, um, there's still, it still is a working telescope. And, and, uh, and, uh, and yes, we're very lucky to have it uh, in, in our mar today. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we should say that um, the uh, uh, the objects that you have there, it's, you have more than just the King's Telescope, don't you? And you, in fact, you have many objects that were here at the um, King's Observatory. And what other links are there that, um, in terms of the objects that you have that were transferred from um, the King's Observatory to the Armagh Observatory? Yes, so I guess the, the story of the of the of this it's, it's one of these long and complicated involved stories that goes back to Queen Victoria, yeah. and I guess the, guess the short story is that she must have been doing a, a tidy up of her palaces about a century after, of course, uh, uh, the event itself, uh, and and there was this observatory here, and she didn't know what to do with it, and uh, and essentially it got offered to my observatory. It was a long, interesting uh, wrangle time uh, in a sense that uh, protocol came in. I believe a number of different places that. Uh, wanted to have it. Uh, and look, Amar got offered it, but it has to be said that a century after the event, the telescopes, of course, were no longer state-of-the-art telescopes. Okay. Uh, and so while it, it, you were never going to be able to do frontier science in the middle of the 19th century using telescopes in the middle of the 18th century, but at the yeah. same time, the director at Amar, Romney Robinson, who was a, a great pioneer of his day, he couldn't say no to the Queen, of course. And so, cut a long story short, we were very lucky to in inherit uh, the, the collection and uh, we got the telescopes. In fact, there were several telescopes. There's a whole collection of optics that go with and particularly there's the clock with the regulator you see behind me, the Shelton regulator from some 1769. It was the best telescope it's it's of its type in the world at the time. It still, as I say, wasn't quite good enough to measure time to the accuracy required. You had to be uh, no worse than a second uh, um, out when taking these clocks right across the world. So the technology wasn't quite up there, but nevertheless, this was a very important experiment of its day, and it led to many things uh, that happened uh, after that in terms of international collaboration uh, in science. Yeah. 
you said you told me that you'd read all the correspondence about you know the uh, the issues about whether the object should be, go to Armagh or not, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those must have been fascinating documents. Do you have them actually in well, Armagh yourself, or did you have to do some yes. in-depth research? No, no, we, we do actually have, um, we have extensive archives here in our mom. I mean, our, our observatory has been going since 1790 and all the paperwork and all the letters and correspondence have, that have been sent are still here in our archive. So indeed, you can see at least the side of the, of the discussions that, that take place. And, uh, and people got very, very um, het up. We've got people um, very working on our side and other people who wanted the telescopes to go elsewhere. There was, it was, in the end, it was a matter of protocol and honor and these good victories. Victorian values uh, uh, ended up here. We had to build a special extent of the observatory in Amar to house the instruments. There wasn't actually a place in the observatory at the time. In fact, there's a tower in the middle of our observatory now where the instruments were put when, when they came here. Yes, it's interesting because the uh, the cupola the, of, of your uh, observatory and the one at the King's Observatory look very similar indeed. Um, perhaps not surprising from the era they were built in. Well, indeed, the dome that uh, is on the on the King's Observatory uh, is 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 a, is a marker of the way of the trees um, uh, developed uh, after that. Uh, Amar and in fact Dun Sink in Dublin were the next observatories to really have domes. They had another great innovation: was the dome was put on a pier, which went all the way into the ground, so the telescope was actually separated from the rest of the building. And this became the forerunner of how all telescopes in the world are built today. So it does go back to uh, the time when essentially the observatory building became as important for doing the astronomy uh, as, as the instruments that were put inside it. So it was, it was a major innovation, I guess, in, in, in the science of astronomy at the time. Yeah, yeah. I must admit, in, in modern times, obviously, I suppose those of us who've seen some of the more modern observatories, the, the domes are extraordinary things, aren't they? They're, you know, the ones I know you've been in are Hawaii and down in Antarctica, but the Hawaiian ones are, those, are monstrous things, the chilly ones as well, aren't they? Oh, they are. I mean, a, a modern observatory is like it's like a, a cathedral for science. If you're inside a dome, when the telescope is turning, the dome is turning. It's really quite a, a sort of transcendental experience, and it's all built there for science to look at the stars and understand what they are. So yes, the dome is the heart of a heart of astronomy today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we hope that people who will be coming to our exhibition, which will be opening on the 13th of February, um, hopefully in person when the COVID restrictions are um, lifted, but this exhibition will be online as will be this um, conversation as well. We hope that um, they'll be inspired to look more into the science behind the King's Observatory over its nearly um, 200 years of not just astronomy, but meteorological studies as well and studies of time. Um, that they'll be inspired by what they've seen, particularly some of the youngsters who will come, the school children, the, the family groups as well. Um, and we hope that they'll obviously take some inspiration from what they see through the exhibition as well. Can I ask how you became interested in astronomy? Ah, that's an interesting question. And tell the truth, um, I, I guess it was in my early days, grew up in the Alpha Australia, and it must have been. I must have been seeing those spectacularly dark skies and yeah. that must have been that inspiration. But I did move to London uh, at about the age of nine and I, I know I had a teacher who was very inspiring and uh, he was a very keen amateur astronomer and I remember looking out through with his telescope in the backyard and the schools. So, uh, so I think all these were, it goes back to my childhood. I've always been inspired by the stars. Yeah, yeah. Um, one can understand that. I'm sure that's one of the first presents um, you get as a youngster, isn't it? Something about the stars. If it's not prehistoric animals, dinosaurs, it's something about the stars, isn't it? And there are wonderful apps that yes, they yes. have. I've got one on my phone where you point it at the sky and it will tell you exactly what you're looking at. So, you know, that's an, you know, an easy layman's sort of way of looking for astronomy. But you've travelled the world, haven't you? From Hawaii to Chile to Antarctica. I mean, you've studied in some of the most extreme um, um, environments as well as the perhaps the most technologically advanced ones as well. Um, what do you see as the relevance of astronomy today in your studies, particularly in the many issues that challenge us in the world, um, you know, whether it's climate change or whatever it is? What's the relevance of modern day studying of astronomy, do you think, to the world problems that we face? Yes, I, I have been fortunate to observe the stars from every continent and see them from extreme environments where you're still halfway to space. Yeah. And one of the things you, you learn, the more you study uh, the stars, you learn how special um, our place in the universe 
is doesn't matter how many stars we see, how many planets we keep finding out there, and we're finding new planets all the time. Even our own solar system, we haven't found anywhere anything close to planet Earth at the moment. It really is a special, fragile place. And so it gives you a cosmic perspective about our place in the universe and, and how, how important it is we look after our own home so that we can continue indeed to study and be inspired by the stars. We do need to look after our own home first. Yes, yes. Obviously, um, looking at the ties that there are between our Mars and observatory, and I know at the uh, King's Observatory now is a private residence, it's no longer functions there, and um, it went through many different changes because changing from the King's Observatory it then became part of the Royal Observatory at Greenwich and then preceded that and then was taken over by Greenwich. Then it became part of the Meteorological Service here in this country. It even at one point was part of the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, nearby to us here. Um, it's obviously gone through many different guises, but your, your observatory has a unique record, doesn't it, in terms of its history and what it's done. In, is it 269 years? I know you're going to correct me on it's, when the record It's 1790, so 231 uh, years, I get my numbers. I mean, what's remarkable about Amal is that we have been doing astronomy in the observatory in Amal continuously since its foundation. So it makes it the oldest observatory uh, in, in these whole islands, the whole British Isles, which has been cont continuously used for its original purposes. Yeah. Uh, and we have all the telescopes that were used during that time are still here, and most of them are in their original places. So you can actually see the the development and evolution of the of the science of astronomy over over these sort of three centuries uh, when you come to our Ma, you can see the telescope in the original. So the oldest telescope we have indeed is King George's, which does predate our Ma, but all our other telescopes, the one in the in the big building behind me, is actually the oldest telescope in the world, which is still in its original location. It was put in there in 1795 and it's still there today and still actually works. So we wouldn't use it for science, it still actually works. Yeah, yeah. And you have a continuous, the record, the longest continuous record of weather reporting, is it? Well, yes, and this is actually another link to Q because uh, the, the meteorology, meteorology has been an important part of our Maori. We started measuring the weather in 1795 and every single day we, uh, we measure the weather. So it's the longest uh, single uh, daily climatic record in these islands. Uh, and there were links to the setup of of the of the UK meteorology office, and that had a major role at, at Kew and the King's Observatory. And indeed, uh, for instance, one example was the, the, the way we measure wind speed. It's called the anemometer. It was invented by one of my predecessors, uh, Romney Robinson, uh, and basically it's spinning vanes, uh, um, uh, which, which the wind, wind blows around. The original manuscript where he designed that was actually uh, housed in the in the King's Observatory in Kew. When, when the Met Office moved to Bracknell, it was moved moved out of there. So but there have been indeed strong links with meteorology as well as the astronomy uh, between uh, between uh, Amma uh, and uh, and the King's Observatory. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, and it's really good of you, Professor, to um, spend this time talking about the links and also about the astronomy and about the Short's Telescope as well. Um, it's a real shame that we were not able to have the actual um, um, telescope in one of our cases in the exhibition at Richmond. But doing this conversation and seeing it there on screen is really a, a real t um, taste of what the important heritage is in terms of the science that links the King's Observatory with the um, progress, not just in science, in astronomy and meteorology, meteorology, meteorology and also, of course, it's a hard word. in the measurement of time as well. Um, and that's what we're celebrating in our exhibition as well. And, um, you know, we particularly had wanted to show the aspect of the connections between the two observatories. And it was most fortunate that we found the link between them. And as I said, if times had been more normal, I hope that we would have been welcoming you, Professor, to our museum and that you would have been opening the exhibition. So perhaps we can finish by you actually formally opening our exhibition of the King's Observatory um, for us now. OK, well, thank you for those kind words, Hilda. Indeed, I, would, I wish I was there and I do hope I can come and visit one day. Yeah. But this is the best we can do now. So may I formally open uh, your exhibition about the King's Observatory uh, in the Richmond Museum. And I hope you all enjoy visiting it and learning about the wonderful history of science that you will see there. Thank you very much, Professor. And we would encourage people not only to come to our exhibition, but when time is traveling is freer, to actually come over to Omar to see your 
um, observatory and planetarium, which of course we haven't mentioned, which it was started by Patrick Moore, I believe. Yes, indeed. And we'd be delighted for you to visit. Yes, we also have the longest running planetarium in these islands, too. And Patrick Moore, so Patrick Moore was the first director. It was opened in 1968. And we can take you on a journey anywhere in the universe in our wonderful planetarium. So we'd be, be delighted if you could come over. That would be wonderful. We'll encourage people to do that. Thank you very much, Professor Burton. And um, our best wishes to everybody over in Amar as well. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.